hear a little bit about some of the interesting features of being human, and in particular, our drive for explanation. So in a talk in 1997 in Pittsburgh, the late evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould defined humans as the primates who tell stories. Right? He picked this out as a characteristic that differentiates us from other primates. Two years later, the psychologist Robin Dawes amended this slightly. He defined us as the humans, uh, sorry, the primates whose cognitive capacity shuts down in the absence of a story. So what he had in mind here was that we're often not very good at making sense of isolated facts, isolated statistics, pieces of information that we don't know how to put together or combine into some sort of coherent story. But when you give us a story, we do much better in terms of our ability to make sense of things, to use disparate pieces of information in a coherent way, and so on. So the kind of story he really had in mind here was something like a causal narrative, right? a causal explanation that puts different pieces together to help us make sense of them. Now, I think there's one domain in which we're all really familiar with the power of these kinds of stories or causal narratives that we tell ourselves, and that's literature uh, or, or other kinds of stories in other media, be it film or theater. Right? I think we probably all had the experience of being really gripped by a story or a narrative in these kinds of media. But there's lots of other cases in everyday life where I think you can see the power of this and where there's really been some interesting empirical research. So let me give you just two examples. So one of them is in the context of political debate. So I'm sure some of you have been listening to uh, political debates recently. And one thing that you might have noticed, <laughs> one thing that you might have noticed is that sometimes people will offer really compelling evidence and statistics from various uh, sources, but often what they'll give you is some sort of a narrative or anecdote to try to argue for some point. Right? They might argue against a particular approach to taxation by telling you the story of one individual business owner who uh, faced bankruptcy. Or they might try to convince you for the value of some particular approach to healthcare by telling you about one particular person and how a healthcare reform had these uh, transformative experiences for that particular individual. And empirical research has been done on the persuasive effects of these kinds of narratives. And in fact, these do have some power to change people's beliefs, to change their attitudes, to change their behaviors, and to change their intentions. Right? So these kinds of narratives that you see in this political context can actually be really powerful. And you see this in many other domains as well. So for example, if you want to change people's health behavior, a compelling narrative that illustrates some particular risk or some particular uh, good practice can actually be very compelling. Another domain where you see this is in the law. So if you imagine that you're a juror, you're being presented with two stories about what happened. You're, there's a prosecution story about what happened, and there's a defense story about what happened. And one of the uh, most prominent models of juror decision-making basically suggests that what jurors are doing is they're evaluating how good these stories are, sort of as stories. You know, how good is the narrative that the prosecution is telling us? How good is the narrative that the defense is telling us? And then that's very strongly related to whether or not they decide that somebody is ultimately guilty or not. So as one example of how powerful this is, there have been some interesting studies where they present people with evidence from an actual trial. So these are mock jurors pretending as if they were jurors using the evidence from an actual trial. And some of the participants will be given the evidence from the prosecution in the order that it happened to be presented at the trial. And other people will have the same exact evidence, but reordered to correspond to the chronology of the story. So for example, if in the actual trial, for whatever reason, they called a witness who testified related to something that happened later in a story, and then afterwards had somebody speak about something happening earlier, what they would do for half of the participants is swap the order so that people actually get things in the order in which they occurred in the chronological narrative. So what does that do? Well, it makes it much easier for people to appreciate the narrative unfolding of the event, and it ultimately makes them more likely to go with the prosecution. Right? So if whichever side is presented as sort of a better story, where a better story can be as simple as presenting things in the right order, that has a significant effect on how jurors make decisions. Right? So these are just a couple of domains where you see that the ability to put things into sort of a coherent picture or a story or an explanation has this really profound effect with these very real world consequences. So one way that's useful, I think, to get a handle on what it is these kinds of narratives or explanations do for us is to consider the alternatives. And you can again see this across a variety of domains. So as a first one, think about science, right? So in science, we're really after good theories, not just descriptions, 
right? We're pretty unsatisfied if the only thing that science can do is just describe a phenomenon. We typically want more than that. We want something that gives us sort of a, a causal model or a real explanation for what's going on. You see this in history as well. It's pretty unsatisfying to read a historical text uh, that just give, tells you the, you know, one event happened, and then another event happened, and then another event happened, and that's it. We want to understand something about the logical connections between these events or how they fit together, right? We want a good narrative, not just a sequence of events. In the case of religion, you sometimes see this as well. So I think this is not true for all kinds of religious narratives or explanations, but often what they do is they give us some sort of a purpose of explanation for what we're doing here, for why it is that the features of our world have the properties that they have. Um, it doesn't suggest that things are just a mere accident or that things just happened. And in all of these cases, I think you sort of feel the pull of this common thread that we really like something more coherent, a good narrative, a good story to pull things together. So I've given you lots of varied examples of this idea that we're really compelled by something like a good causal story or a good explanation. And of course, these examples all are quite different and have their own nuances. But what I think underlies all of these cases is something about trying to get at a real sense of understanding, right? At all of these cases, it seems like when you get the explanation, when you get the narrative, when you get the story, what you get is something that allows you to get some sense of understanding what would otherwise be disparate events or disparate facts in a more satisfying way. And one of the things that we've tried to do in my lab at UC Berkeley, the Concepts and Cognition Lab, is to try to take a scientific approach to understanding this sense of understanding, right? What is it that these stories or narratives do for us? Why are we so drawn to them? So how do you take a scientific approach to this, right? This is a very sort of big set of general ideas. And so often what we do is we try to carve up little pieces of these and try to rigorously characterize different kinds of components that go into our reasoning in these kinds of cases in order to get a better grasp of what the general phenomenon is. And so you're gonna help me do this today in an experiment, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but what I wanna do first is motivate one of the specific ways that we have started to approach this general question about why we're so compelled by information that takes this kind of explanatory or narrative form. And that's by focusing on the question of explanations. And in particular, why it is that we're so motivated to explain, right? Uh, so here we have this toddler demanding an explanation, but you've probably uh, all had this feeling of encountering some experience or some observation that really seems to demand an explanation. And it's a very visceral kind of demand that it is, right? So one question that's motivated some of my research is this question about why it is that we are so motivated to explain, right? What is it that explaining does for us? Um, now there's a first part of this answer which I think is somewhat intuitive which is that by seeking an explanation, you're probably gonna go out into the world and learn really valuable stuff. So if you think about a scientist trying to find an explanation, that scientist might go out, do good experiments, and learn about the world, and that seems like a very valuable thing to do. If you're looking for an explanation, you might ask a knowledgeable friend, or you might go on Google, or you might get information in some form from a book, um, and that's a very good way to learn about the world. Um, in fact, my, um, my colleague, Alison Gopnik, likes to put this uh, basic idea much more provocatively and in an evolutionary context. So she has a paper uh, called Explanation as Orgasm. And the basic analogy she's drawing is, uh, well, I'll read you her quote. So she suggests that explanation is to theory formation, by which she has in mind learning about the causal structure of the world, basically trying to build a causal map of the world. So explanation is to theory formation as orgasm is to reproduction, the phenomenological mark of the fulfillment of an evolutionary determined drive. Okay, so the idea is that we're uh, often motivated, for example, uh, towards orgasms because that's, that encourages us to engage in this activity which has high fitness, right? So you can say evolution has rewarded us for this activity in this way. And so she's arguing here that that satisfying sense of having found a good explanation is playing a similar role. Similar role. We're really motivated to get explanations because they encourage us to engage in an activity which is very beneficial for us, namely the activity of going out into the world learning stuff and coming up with a good causal map of the way the world works, which is gonna help us to navigate the world more effectively. So I think this is actually one important reason why we might be so motivated to explain. But what I hope to illustrate through the experiment that you are about to help me with is that there's also some additional, much more subtle ways in which explanation uh, might do something really special for us. And so for this experiment, what I'm gonna have to ask you to do is to use your imaginations for a moment 
And imagine that you are anthropologists who've been sent to study planet Zorg. There, of course, is planet Zorg. Um, now, the uh, inhabitants of planet Zorg are pretty sophisticated uh, creatures, and they've developed all sorts of interesting artifacts. So, for example, there's two types of robots on planet Zorg. There's Glorps and Drents. There's these different types of containers. So here's just two types of containers, Ordeeps and Andrax. There's different types of plants found here. There's their somps and their thonts. And part of your job is to try to make sense of these various kinds of classifications on planet Zorg. So what is it that makes something a Glorp versus a Drent? What is it that makes something an Ordeep versus an Andrax? What is it that makes something a somp versus a thont? So there's a handout going around, which I'm gonna ask you to not look at yet until everybody has one. <laughs> I know, they're, very, they're, they're extremely, they're colorful, they're exciting, but you'll have to resist for a moment as they go around. Um, so in a moment, everyone will have a handout, and I'm going to start to tell you what we're going to do for this experiment. All right, so what I'm going to do is you can either do this on your own, or you can do it with a partner, up to you. You're going to take a few minutes to study the glorps and the drents. So, so your handout includes images of these three, uh, these three shots here. Um, and they're also labeled. So for example, you'll be able to see this is a, a Glorp or a Drent and so on. And what I want you to do is either on your own or with a partner, for each of these items, take about 30 seconds and then follow the prompt below it. So there's gonna be a little prompt asking you to do something below each of these images. And for about 30 seconds for each of these items, I want you to respond to that prompt, either silently in your head or if you wanna do this with a partner, you can talk to a partner. If you do this with a partner, your partner should just listen. They shouldn't necessarily give you feedback. And then if you do this with a partner, I'm gonna want you to switch. So one of you will be speaking and the other one listening as you study Glorps and Drents. And the other one will be speaking and the other one listening as you study the Ordeeps and the Andrax. So we'll, we'll take about six minutes to do this and six minutes to do this. And then for now, you can leave the somps and thonts to the side. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start a, count, a timer here for six minutes. And so you should take those six minutes to study the Glorps and the Drents on your handout as an anthropologist on Planet Zorg, either silently or with a partner. So I did say that this was an experiment, and that was literally true in the sense that you were randomly assigned to be in one of two experimental conditions. So everyone was looking at the same robots, but half of you got prompts to describe each of the robots. So who are our describers? All right, so mostly over here. Excellent, you are our describers. Half of you got prompts to try to explain for each robot, why might this robot be a Drent? Or why might this robot be a Glorf? So who are our explainers? Excellent, okay. Um, so will this make a difference to your learning? Um, We'll find out in a moment, but first, what is it that you might have learned here? Okay, so you were trying to learn about the difference between Glorps and Drents on Planet Zorg. Does anybody notice any patterns that seem to differentiate Glorps and Drents? We have a hand here. The letters do differentiate them. That is not what we were going for, but you are absolutely right. The letters do differentiate them. A hand over here. Excellent. There's a pattern with the feet. So you might have noticed that all of the feet shapes are unique, but can you say more about what they have in common? Um, the have flat feet and Excellent, so if you hadn't noticed that already, so although all the, I hear a lot of ahs, so not everybody got that. <laughs> um, I, I see another hand here, yeah? Oh, you okay, any, any other patterns people noticed? Oh, yes, I saw a hand up there. Ah, interesting, okay. So you notice, so in a sense it's that color is not correlated with a category membership because each color appears in each category once. Yeah, so that, that it, it is a pattern, but it's not a pattern that you could use to figure out what a Glorp or a Drent is because the colors appear in both of them. So there's one other pattern which maybe you noticed and just discarded because you realized it didn't work very well, which I'm gonna call, sorry? Oh, position, that's right. So there's a bunch of things on here which, are genuine distinctions, position on the page, which letter is associated with their names, and so on. True, not what we were going for, but absolutely true. Um, so these were deliberately designed to be complicated enough that there's a lot of stuff you could pay attention to, like the colors and the different feed shapes and so on, 
but we deliberately built in two kinds of patterns in designing these. So one of them I'm going to call the 75% pattern because it doesn't hold for all of them. It only holds for 75%. And I'm guessing a lot of you might have noticed this, but because it's not perfect, you kind of discarded it. So what is this pattern? Most drents are round and most glorps are square in terms of their main body, but in each case there's an exception. And that's why I'm going to refer to this as a 75% pattern because it doesn't capture all of them, it captures 75% of them. There was this more subtle pattern, which we, we, uh, at least one person figured out, and I suspect many of you, having to do with the, the foot shape, which is whether or not the feet were pointy versus flat at the bottom. And if you figured that out, you could classify all eight of these accurately, which is why we refer to this as the 100% rule. Okay, so now I'm gonna collect some data to figure out if what you learned from these, whether you detected these patterns, differed depending on whether you were a describer or an explainer. Okay, so now I need you to be honest here in reporting what it is that you first discovered here. So for those of you who were describers, if you have your smartphone out, here's again the URL that you can go to. And the first question that you can respond to when you go to that URL is uh, this question about what it was that you learned when studying these glorps and drents. So did you only figure out the 75% pattern about square versus round bodies? Did you only figure out this 100% pattern about pointy versus flat feet? Did you discover both of them or neither of them? Or if this question doesn't apply to you because you were not a describer, you were an explainer, or because you were just listening to your partner rather than actually describing, then you can go ahead and, and select that last option. On the second, for the first question, if you're an explainer, you should put the last option. For the second question, question two, that one is for the explainers. And there are the explainers can indicate which patterns they discovered. And now it's the describers who should put in the last option because this doesn't apply to you. Okay, if you still need to enter your responses, go ahead and continue to do so. Meanwhile, I'll poll you on whether anybody figured anything out about the containers. So here we have the Andrax and the Ordeeps. I think this one's probably a little tougher, but I'll, I'll see how you guys did. Um, did anybody notice any patterns here? Hand there. Excellent, okay. So we have someone who discovered the 100% pattern here. So it's about the relative size of the opening versus the base. So for the Andrax, the top is smaller than the bottom, and for the Ordeeps, the top is wider than the bottom. Um, there's a few other things here that, that you might have noticed. Did anybody notice anything else? The lips. the lips, that's right. So the lips, it's not a perfect rule, but it's a pattern. It's a real pattern there, right? So you might have noticed that I believe it's all of the Andrax have sort of lips around the top, but there's this one exception. There's an Ordeep that does too. The other thing that might have jumped out at you is that most of the Andrax are tall and skinny, and most of the Ordeeps are uh, sort of wide, but in each case there's an exception, right? So you'll notice that this mirrors the structure of the case we just looked at. There was one perfect or 100% pattern that seems to count for all eight, but there's a few other things you might have picked up on that could count for 75% of them about, right, which would be pretty good. So what I'm gonna have you do now is honestly report what you spontaneously discovered on your own as you described or you explained. So again, the first question here is just for the describers. That's question three. And the question that follows question four is just for the explainers. And again, for these cases, what I want you to do is indicate whether you discovered one of these 75% patterns, the lip, or the general proportions, um, or if you discovered the 100% pattern about the top versus the bottom, both or neither. Okay, so while the data that you just entered is being compiled, I'm gonna show you what happens when you do this in the lab, right? So you just participated in an experiment that we've actually run various versions of. Uh, we do it under slightly better controlled circumstances than, than here, but they're also much less fun circumstances. So you should be, you know, you got to do the fun version here. The way this works in the lab is participants will come in, we'll, for example, tell them that their task is to learn to differentiate these glorps and these strengths. They'll get to see all eight of them. And then what they'll do is they'll have all eight for reference, but they'll have on the computer in front of them one by one, each of these will appear for a fixed amount of time, say 30 seconds. And during those 30 seconds, they're given a particular prompt about what they're supposed to do as they study this item. 
one group of participants is always prompted to explain why do you think this one might be a glorp? Why do you think this one might be a drench? Right, we're really trying to get those people to engage in this process of explanation, of sense making. In the control condition, we've done a variety of different things. Sometimes we have people describe each of the robots, which is what we did tonight. Sometimes we have people just think aloud while they're studying the robots. Sometimes we don't give them any particular instructions. We just tell them, remember, you're learning to differentiate glorps and drents. Study for 30 seconds, and they can do whatever they want. We then have them categorize novel robots, and that gives us a way to sort of implicitly see what is it that they discovered uh, and what are they using to classify these new cases. And then we basically explicitly ask them, what did you notice as differences between these? And we can code whether or not they discovered this 100% foot pattern, whether or not they discovered the 75% body pattern, or anything else that they might have noticed. Here's what we find. Okay, so here's data. Always makes me very excited. Okay, so we have the three different conditions here. For, this is still the lab version. This is not your data yet. Um, and what I'm plotting here is the proportion of our participants who discovered that 100% foot rule. Okay, so if we look for the first data bar here, we have people in the control condition who were prompted to describe. They only discovered it about 10% of the time. So if you were a describer and you didn't figure it out in the course of this experiment, you're in you know, pretty good company. Most people did not. But when we prompted people to explain, even though they had the same task otherwise, even though they had the exact same data in front of them, that number shot up to something closer to 40%. Right, so just prompting people to explain made them about three times more likely to discover this subtle underlying pattern in what they were trying to explain. And that's an effect that we find reliably across these cases. Right, so the exact numbers vary here. But what we find consistently is that the participants who are prompted to explain are much more likely to discover this than the participants who are not prompted to explain. And there's an interesting way in which I think this is just a much more subtle kind of effective explanation then the idea that what explanation leads us to do is to go out into the world and get more data. Because in this case, you all had the same data, right? Everyone in this room and everyone in my experiments has the same eight robots in front of them that they're studying. So what's different about the people who are engaging in explanation and the people who aren't? It's not the data they have in front of them. It's something about how they're processing that information that's leading them to learn something different. And I'll say a bit more in a moment about what I think that difference is in how they're processing that information. Before I do, let me check in. Do we have, do we have our data from here yet? We do? All right, let's, let's see if this worked here. My first time trying to replicate an experiment in a, um, after people have had alcoholic beverages, so we'll, we'll see if it works. Um, oh, all right. Okay, so what we have here are the describers, and here we have the explainers. And that looks to me to be, I mean, I'm just doing the statistics in my head here. That looks to me to be actually a pretty dramatic effect, right? So what are we seeing here? I'll walk you through this. Um, okay, so in both groups, we have about 22 people reporting that they discovered the 75% pattern. So that doesn't seem to be different across groups. Um, in both groups, we have, you know, about the same number of people who only discovered the 100% rule. But now look at this yellow bar. Here, the explainers were, it looks to me, significantly more likely to discover both of these than those who were prompted to describe with the neither rate about the same, right? So I, I should say, this is, in the subtle details, this is not what we find in the lab. So in the lab, what we find is that this red bar would go up, but not the yellow bar. But nonetheless, we see this pretty, you know, that's a pretty big difference, right? Because again, you were all in this, you know, you all had the same task. Otherwise, you were trying to learn to differentiate these two types of robots. Um, you had the same information in front of you, but just this difference in the prompt, especially for those of you who are following the prompts, led to this pretty big difference in what you learned. Okay, so that's for the robots. What do, what do the containers look like? Oh my. Okay. This is interesting. Okay, so again, we're getting a difference, but this is not the typical difference we find in the lab. And my guess is that it's because you didn't have a lot of time. So my guess is that had we given you more time, so what we're seeing here, just to walk you through this, what we're seeing here, is those who were prompted to explain were much more likely to discover the 75% pattern, but had not yet figured out the 100% pattern, which would be you know, reflected in one of these two lines here. My guess is that if I had given you more time, what we would have seen is a lot of these explainers who initially found this, being unsatisfied with that because it didn't capture all eight, perseverating and looking for something better, and then eventually getting a pattern more like what we saw in the previous graph. 
That's my guess. But you, could, but you can see already, even though we didn't get exactly in the, in the details what I would have predicted, just this difference in whether you were describing or explaining had a pretty big effect on what it was that people learned from these kinds of cases. And that's kind of interesting and suggests something really powerful about explanation. So let me show you some more data from the lab. I should say we have lots of variants of these types of experiments. I'm just showing you kind of a snippet here. So even kids can do this. Um, to do this with kids, we did not use GLORPs and Drents and Planet Zorg. We did this a little bit differently. What we did is that we introduced in the study five-year-olds to this uh, device called the Blicket Detector. And a Blicket Detector is a physical box that they see. And when some objects go on it, the device plays music. When other objects go on it, nothing happens. So they're introduced to this Blicket Detector. They see that when this object goes on it, the music plays. When this object goes on it, the music does not play. In case you're wondering, these were actually physical objects that had Legos of different colors on the front and on the top. So that's what you're seeing depicted here. They saw a total of eight objects where these four made the detector go and these four did not. I know this one's tricky, but <laughs> you might notice patterns here. In fact, you might even notice that the patterns follow the same structure as what you just did, right? So again, we have a 100% pattern. If you didn't spot it, don't worry, the five-year-olds thought it was hard too. Um, so we have green on top versus yellow on top, that's a 100% pattern. Red on the front versus white on the front, that's a 75% pattern. Okay, so what's the critical manipulation here? Because we didn't give the five-year-olds sheets of paper telling them to explain or to describe. What we did here is that every time they saw one of these objects go onto the detector, they were asked a question. For the explainers, the question was, why did this one make my machine go? Or when it didn't make the machine go, why didn't this one make my machine go? Right, so we were prompting them to engage in explanation. For a control condition, we wanted the kids to pay just as much attention, to have just as much attention drawn to the relationship between the object and the detector, but without having them explain. So what we asked them each time one of these went on to the detector was, what happened to my machine when I put this one on? Did it make it play music? And they would answer yes or no. So then what we would do, as he wanted to figure out which of these patterns did they pick up on and which of these patterns do they think is a better basis for figuring out what will make the machine go. So what we would do is we had these sort of special ways of sort of obscuring blocks behind these screens and so we'd show them these two blocks. One of them would be obscured so that all they could see was that there was a green Lego on top but they could not see what was on the front. For another one, they could see that there was a red Lego in the front but they could not see what was on the top. And we said, which of these two do you think is gonna make my machine go? Right, the one that has the green on top or the one that has the uh, red in the front? Right, so we're basically pitting these two patterns against each other to see which one they think is a better basis to predicting what will make the machine go. Here's what we found. So here are the kids in the control condition, kids in the explain condition. On the y-axis here is the proportion of these kids who are choosing to go with a 100% pattern in making their prediction. And what you can see here is that the kids in the control condition are actually not different from chance. They're equally likely to say, they, they, you know, they like each block just as much as the other one. It's not because they don't understand the question, it's not because they weren't paying attention, because we have a bunch of other questions to test that they, they, you know, they knew what was going on. They just didn't have a preference. But for the kids who were prompted to explain, we see a reliable preference for the 100% pattern over the 75% pattern. Okay, so why are we so motivated to explain? Um, well, I think there's this intuitive answer that explanation plays a really, really important role in learning. One of the ways it does that is by motivating us to go out and collect new information. But even with the information we already have, it changes the way that we process that information. And I wanna tell you a little bit about what I think is going on here and what the research in our lab suggests is going on there, and then I'll stop so we can have a more general discussion. Okay, so what's going on here? I think the key insight is that not all explanations are equal. We are actually extremely picky about what makes something a good or a satisfying explanation, a good or a satisfying story. And some of the characteristics that we care a lot about are things that are probably very familiar to you. So one of them is known as Occam's razor, you've probably come across, right? Some sort of preference for simplicity or principle of parsimony. We tend to prefer explanations that are simpler. And there's research from my lab and others that tries to sort of quantify in what sense we prefer explanations that are simpler, uh, but we find that this is the case. Both children and adults do seem to prefer simpler explanations. The other thing that we prefer is something that sometimes gets referred to as scope or generality. 
But in the context of this experiment, it's easiest to think about it as preferring cases with no exceptions, right? We like explanations that apply very broadly, that have a very broad scope, apply to lots of cases. When there are exceptions, we don't like them to be totally arbitrary. We like to have an explanation for why that case is different. And so what I think is going on in the experiments that you just did now, where, for example, you were looking at these glorps and drents, is that when you were looking for explanations, you were trying to find some broad, simple pattern underlying what you were trying to explain. You were looking for some sort of broad, simple pattern or principle that differentiated glorps and drents. That had a few consequences. One consequence that when you found a 75% rule, as an explainer, you would have been much less satisfied than as a describer. Right? Because that's just not a very good explanation. It doesn't have a, you know, the scope that you would want. The exceptions seem totally arbitrary. That's really unsatisfying. The other thing is that it makes you go beyond the obvious or what appearances look like to look for something more subtle that's underlying what you're trying to explain in order to find that simple, broad principle. And so those factors combine to make you look for different kinds of things even though you're faced with the same data when you're engaged in explanation versus engaged in something else. Now, in lots of cases, this is an extremely powerful and fantastic ability that explanation gives us. So in pedagogical context, this is really terrific. Um, there's lots of experiments that show that if you have students and you're trying to teach them some sort of mathematical principle, you give half of them worked out examples and tell them to explain to themselves. You give half of them examples and tell them to think out loud or study them twice. And the kids who explain to themselves tend to learn better. Right? So in a lot of cases, this is really powerful. In science, this is really, really powerful. In many cases, it pushes us to look for these grand unified theories. But there's a few cases where maybe this is not so great. And so one example might be something like a conspiracy theory. Right? So what are the features, what are the features of a conspiracy theory? Um, not all conspiracy theories are the same. But very often what they involve is sort of cherry picking different bits of data that maybe have nothing to do with each other, choosing some events that are maybe just the result of chance but trying to explain them in some unified way that goes back to some single individual or some single organization that's responsible for those different pieces of evidence. So some of the time, the real explanation is just really unsatisfying. It's that that happened to chance, and it's just a coincidence that these things happened over here, right? But that's really unsatisfying. So maybe some kinds of conspiracy theories are errors of over-explaining, right? Trying to come up with a good story for what's in fact noise. Superstition has some of the same character. Right? It's really unsatisfying to explain why we had something bad happen to us by just saying it was bad luck. Right? We tend to want to find some sort of underlying cause or principle that will help us control it, that will help us predict it. Again, this might be an error of over-explaining. Some of the time, things are just due to chance. That's a really unsatisfying explanation, but sometimes that's the best we can do. So what I'm hoping to leave you with is uh, two important lessons. So one is, just an appreciation of sort of how remarkable our ability to explain is, to tell a good story, to find structure and or make sense of something that uh, we might not have otherwise been able to. It's an incredibly powerful tool that I think drives a lot of science, it drives a lot of children's development, and it drives a lot of our ability to negotiate the everyday world. But it's also a double-edged sword. Because when there is something simple and broad out there to discover, engaging an explanation can help us get there. But when there's nothing there, when the world really just is idiosyncratic and complex, when there is no simple underlying pattern, then explaining might actually systematically lead us astray. Thank you.